So, so the, the idea here today is to give you a perspective of the Swedish uh, plans and problems uh, for the repository for spent nuclear fuel. Uh, and I work for an organization called MKG. And um, the organization uh, was founded in 2005 already uh, by Naturschutzföreningen. It's, it's like, like the Bund in Germany. It's the largest Swedish um, uh, environmental organization. They have 220,000 members. And for Sweden, that is quite large. We are only nine and a half, ten million people. Um, and then the Friends of the Earth in Sweden have joined us in the last three or four years now. Um, and some of the organizations of Naturschutzföreningen, they have local chapters and they have regional chapters, and they are also involved as well as the youth, at the youth movement of the Swedish Society for Nature Conservation is involved in MKG. Uh, and as I said, I'm, I'm based in Göteborg, and you have my contact information here if you need to get in touch with me, if you want to get in touch with me. So I will very shortly, well, what I will talk about, I will talk about very shortly about the Swedish nuclear power uh, to start with, but then I will go into the background about the plans in Sweden to for a repository for spent nuclear fuel. And they go back into the seventies, these plans. Uh, and then in 2011, the licensing process for the repository started with the application from the industry to the, to the uh, court and to the regulator. And importantly, in 2018, the environmental court recommended the government in an opinion to the government not to uh, go ahead with a decision to say yes before issues regarding the copper canister, I'll come back to the copper canister were resolved. And what still happened was that during last year, there was a lot of discussions and the government approved of the repository on January 27th in 2022. That is it's just a, a basically just uh, two months ago. And I will also tell you a little more, more what is going to happen now. So very shortly about the background of nuclear power in Sweden, we built 12 reactors at four different nuclear power plants during the 70s and 80s. Um, but by December of last year, six of the reactors had been shut down. The other reactors have been upgraded and lifetime extended. And the industry says they will go for 40 years into the 1940s. But of course, this is perhaps questionable, or I would say it's questionable that, that they will continue so long. Um, and one reason for this is that, that the electricity production system is changing rapidly. Um, about half of it is hydroelectric, uh, but we have had a lot of, of uh, wind power being developed in the, in the last decades. Uh, and uh, this trend is continuing very fast. So wind power is growing very fast and wind power works very well together with the hydroelectric power, which is, which is it, which is which can balance wind power. So we have a, a situation where I think that nuclear will have more and more problems of being economic uh, in the Swedish power system. So we'll see how long it lasts. Now there is an interest from the right wing politics for new nuclear, but it's it's very populist, as in many other countries. Um, and there is actually a small little company that wants to build. SMRs, these small modular reactors, and this is getting some focus in the debate. But in reality, this this has no 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 real chance, I think, of, of becoming anything. Um, and then we go over to the waste issues. Um, now, the legislation in Sweden is such that the industry is responsible for finding a method for final disposal of, of the waste and. This meant that the industry, the nuclear industry, they, it was different companies and they, they created the Swedish Nuclear Fuel Waste Management Company, SKB, to take this responsibility. And this was done in the 70s, in the mid 70s. Um, I can also say actually that, that a large part of the Swedish nuclear is actually owned by the government. 
because the, the, the big company Vattenfall, which I think you have experience with in Germany, unfortunately, in many cases, um, the Vattenfall, they, they are a government owned company and they own a number of the nuclear power plants in, in Sweden. Uh, but we also have an economic system with a nuclear waste fund where, where the polluted price principle is supposed to be upheld so that the, the industry pays fees into this fund and there are securities, financial securities also in the system. Uh, this system really has been a problem for many years. Uh, now it is better. Uh, but, and I will not go into that in more detail, but if somebody wants to know more about this, uh, I can certainly provide more information. Now there is transportation system set up in Sweden because we have the coastline and all the reactors are on the coast. Um, so a special ship has been, uh, uh, actually it used to be one old ship and there is a new ship which transports all the waste along the coast. And some of that waste is, is uh, operational, shortly radiated waste from the new operational nuclear reactor, for example, and that is uh, transported to the Forsmark nuclear, nuclear power plant where there is a, an existing repository for this waste. It's 75 meters underground and it's, it's, it's underground the, the sea outside the, the nuclear power plant. And this, the, the, there's also a, a planned expansion for this uh, um, repository to take the, the decommissioning waste. I will not talk very much about that. It, it comes back, it goes, I'll come back to it because it has been part of the, of the decision-making process the last few years in Sweden. Uh, and it connects in that way a bit to the, what's happening with the government and the, and the spent fuel repository. Um, so for the final disposal of the spent nuclear fuel, the industry has been working Actually, I should change that to over 40 years <laughs> uh, since the mid 70s on developing a method. Is they call it the KBS method or the KBS3 method, uh, and then also to find a site for disposal of the Swedish high-level nuclear waste, which is only spent nuclear fuel in Sweden. We had a reprocessing program um, in the 70s that was that was actually cancelled. Uh, mostly due to economic reasons, but also there was, there was this discussion in the 70s and late 70s, early 80s about non-proliferation problems with reprocessing. Um, so the plan is to make the repository at 500 meters depth and also to make an encapsulation plant to put spent fu nuclear fuel in, in copper canisters. Um, important here, I think, is that the Swedish ground, the, the bedrock in Sweden is mostly granite. We have some clay in the south of Sweden, but if we're going to connect also to the German situation, you are, are looking for um, um, sites in Germany. They are looking for sites uh, in granite, in, in clay, and I guess also in salt still, even though Goleben is of course out of the question. Um, but in this, what I will talk about now is very relevant because Many countries are looking for granite, and the problems we have with, with granite and repositories is very relevant for all granite types of, of, of siting. Um, so the spent fuel has, since 1985, also been transported with the ships, as I was saying, to a centralized interim storage facility club, it's called, at the Oskarshamn nuclear power plant. Um, there, the fuel is stalled, stalled, all the Swedish spent fuel is stored in one place in large water filled pools underneath the ground. Um, and here is a, 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 a schematic of the, of the system. I don't know, if, can you see if I, if I move the, this here, the, like yeah. this? Okay, so here, nuclear power plants, the high level well is spent fuel. It's transported by a ship that used to be called Sigin, it's now called Sigrid. Uh, and this then is put into this uh, central central interim storage facility club at this time, and then the plan is to make the encapsulation plant just above the 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 um, this facility. That is where they want to put things into the copper canisters, and then they will ship the 
canisters to Forschmark, where they're then planning this final repository for spent fuel. Um, at the same time, of course, there is this, this low and intermediate short-lived waste that goes into the repository, which is also already at the Forschmark site. But the Forschmark site in Ostama community will have basically all the waste in Sweden now with these decisions that have been taken. And he, here is, the, uh, this is actually the, the new ship, Sigrid, I think. And, and here is the club facility where you see above ground and below ground then these, uh, the, these the spent fuel is in, 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 in these, uh, uh, in these um, uh, special uh, water pools. And here's the above ground uh, of, the, of the facility, the club facility. And here are the reactors at the Oskarshamn uh, nuclear power plant. There were three reactors and two of them have been shut down here. So um, this is the method then for, for uh, spent fuel disposal developed by SKB. The KBS method, it, said, it stands for Schambrenslesäkerhet. It means nuclear waste safety, nuclear, spent nuclear fuel safety, it's, it stands for. And I will come back to the three in, in a short while. Um, so the method uh, uh, has been developed in the 70s and the three, the third version of it is from 1983. And these spent fuel canisters are, are in holes in the granite. Uh, uh, and here is the, the, the whole system. So it's 500 meters down, and then holes are, are drilled in the ground in these tunnels down here. Uh, and the, the copper canister uh, include, holds the spent fuel elements here. And then the canister is put here inside a clay buffer, a bentonite, bentonite clay. And the bentonite clay is supposed to swell because there's, there's flowing, there's groundwater in this system. Uh, and then also there will be bentonite clay in the tunnels. Um, now, the, the importance of this thing is that these are artificial barriers because and the whole system, long-term safety of the system relies on these artificial barriers because um, the, the, it's impossible to, to stop the water in this bedrock. They have tried to find bedrock, which is, does not have so many cracks, but there's always water flowing down in, gra in granite bedrock. Um, so the idea this, is this is supposed to last for hundreds of thousands of years. So whether a copper is a good choice mechanic material was debated already in the 80s. Then there was a long silence for many years, but the issue surfaced again in 2007. And um, I will just say very few words about the siting because that's what you are doing now. The siting process for repository started in the mid 70s and it met local resistance. Um, SKB uh, went around the whole of Sweden and they started to do drilling in the bedrock in different places. And everywhere there was a there was a opposition formed, and um, lo local groups were formed. And the local groups organized them, themselves into a network, an anti-nuclear waste network. Um, and this was quite an e efficient way. And in two, eight, 1986, there was a, a a local group outside. Uh, Uppsala, quite close to, to us, Tama community actually, um, that made demonstrations which were then in TV where the police had were dragging people around, older people around with police dogs on TV. And the government intervened and said, we can't have this continue anymore. So the whole site, pro site, site selection process collapsed uh, in 1986. And the restart was made with a voluntary process. So SKB wrote to all the communities in Sweden asking if they wanted a repository. 
Mm. And two communities in the north of Sweden here, they said, yes, well, we like the, there might be good work, many work uh, um, jobs connected to this, but they had local referenda and the, the people in these communities said no to the, to the politicians uh, regarding this. So finally, the search ended only with nuclear communities and two of them, uh, Oskarsham and Forsmark, where already in Forsmark they had SFR and, and club was, was, SFR and club were being developed and, and were existing. And, and uh, those two communities actually were having competing to get the repository for, for, for many years. And there has been some uh, economic incentive from the nuclear industry also to, to try to convince them. But, but the, 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 these the communities actually have 70 to 80% pro repository uh, in the polls, uh, the populations. Uh, the company made, um, they made explorations for the repository, both in Oskarshamn and Forsmark, but then finally the, the decision in 2009 was that the Forsmark nuclear plant was to be chosen. And I think that we said that we, if there are any questions so far, um, we could take them now, because now I will go into to, to the, the, what has happened uh, more recently, actually the last 10 years, but then that's more <laughs> Yes, so this was now, now more of the general context of the Swedish situation mm -hmm. and how we got there. Are there any questions so far? I have not received any in, in writing. If you have one, you can also briefly raise your hand, but otherwise we can also then dive okay. more deeply into the details of um, yes. what's now well, happening in Forschmark if or you, what will be happening if, in Forschmark. If you are thinking any questions, just, just please please also uh, ask them. Uh, uh, it's, it's always nice to have a discussion, but then I will yeah. continue and I will probably do the rest of my presentation and then yeah. we'll take questions afterwards. Reinhold Schlieper is just jumping oh. jumping in and is wondering about the water for the temporary storage, you know, the thing that basically looks like a swimming pool. Is yes. the water also radioactive there? No, actually not. not. Um, the intent is to, to uh, have it very clean. Uh, and if there are, is any leakage um, from any of the uh, spent fuel elements, uh, the spent fuel elements that they are encapsulated in, in, in special containers. So, so um, uh, it's kind of an interesting place to be in. Actually, when you go down there, it's it's kind of scary because you know that just a few meters in front of you, when you stand there, I've, I've done this a number of times. Stand there, and you know how extremely dangerous it is. But the water actually protects against the radiation quite well. Uh, if, you're, if you are in, in, the, in the facility. And what is important actually is that the cooling of the water is important. Mm. Because you in Germany, I think, have a lot of, of, the, of the, the more modern um, castor uh, uh, containers where you have uh, air cooled, or rather you, mm. you don't use water, you use uh, basically just the, the air cooling, the, 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 uh, uh, the spent fuel because the spent fuel does need to be continually uh, cooled down uh, in the water. So actually now when they're doing the expansion, they're also discussing with, 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 SK, with, the, with the regulator about improving the, their cooling system for this. But the, but the industry says that the, uh, the spent fuel could be in this facility for a hundred years or more. So basically we have been saying that, well, then there is no rush, but on the other hand, the people in the Oskarshamn community are saying we, we don't want to have this waste in our community. So we they want to have it shipped to a Forschmark. <laughs> so they want so, the permanent storage site, but they don't want, want it to be the, the, the stuff that is there to stay. Exactly. <laughs> so we'll see. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. I will Let's then continue. continue. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. So here uh, are. Um, the three reports, the KBS-1, KBS-2, and KBS-3 reports. Um, and they were developed, as I said, in, in the mid-70s to 1983. 
and the KBS-1 report was actually for reprocessed, reprocessed uh, fuel, uh, and the, the, the number two and number three were for uh, spent fuel without reprocessing, like direct disposal of spent fuel. Uh, and uh, basically, number two and number three are, are very similar. But uh, of course, since then, many things have happened. And this is from uh, our previous office. We moved actually to another office just recently. But the, the here you see all these reports um, that actually these reports, mostly they start from when, when MKG uh, was created in 2005. But uh, I mean, a large, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of work has been put into developing the KBS method, especially the siting and, and the, the, the development of how to make a copper canister and, and all these issues. Um, so um, what has happened then in the licensing uh, process? Now, MKG was created in 2005, and we participated in the consultation process for the environmental impact statement. Um, uh, and so many of the questions that were raised in that, of course, they had to be dealt with by the company. Uh, but by, the, by 2011, that's two years after the site selection of Forschmark, they decided that they wanted to hand in a, a license application for the spent fuel repository using the KBS method at the Forschmark nuclear power plant. So it was in March 16, 2011. And the application has been reviewed by both the regulator, which is the Swedish Radiation Safety Authority, because they have a special legislation called the Nuclear Activities Act, but also um, the application has been handed in to the environmental court and they deal with the application according to what is called the environmental code. But both these reviews um, were only in preparation for, for handing over the application to the government because it's a final decision on the license has to be taken by, by the government. So there was an initial review for completeness of the application and it actually took four years to do this. A lot of questions were asked by the regulator, by, by us, by, by others. Uh, and SKB was handing in more documentation during this time. Uh, then the, the application was announced formally to be complete. And during 2016 and 2017, the application was reviewed on issues. And many issues were covered. I mean, I'm talking about Forschmark is actually quite a bad site. There are many problems with the site, with the geology, risk for risk for earthquakes. There are there are there are problems with many things in, in Forschmark. So the site is not maybe also the best. But and also we were discussing the alternative alternative methods. I haven't. I'm not going to speak very much about that. But there is a method called deep boreholes that we we. The Swedish Society of Nature Conservation was already asking SKB to do more work on in the 90s. Um, so many, many issues were, were covered. Also, the area is a very good, it's a very nice nature area, and there are rare species there, red listed species, right in the middle of where, where they want to build the repository. So it's not a, a simple issue, um, this at all. Um, let's make sure. So but one problem became very central in the, in the whole uh, review because the, there, were in, there were researchers at the Ruhr Institute of Technology, KTH in Stockholm, that had by 20, 2007 um, presented a lot of, of, of new studies saying that copper would not work as a canister material. The water um, I'll come back to this, actually, what the issue is with the copper. But the, that, that actually controversy goes back to the 80s, but it became very lively from 2007 onwards. So the, lo the last part of the, of the consultation process, a lot of copper discussions were going on in the, in, the, in the completeness phase, copper corrosion issues or copper canister issues. And also, of course, 
but they were we focused on them and 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 the researchers focused on them in in uh, also when we're discussing issues the review of issues um now what happens here is that uh, and here here are a number of the briefs we, we we wrote a number a number of briefs and we had assistance from some of the researchers to, to do this and they also provided briefs to the court uh, and to 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 the regulator but it, most of the openness of discussions is within the court system the regulator has a more closed review so uh, by the autumn of 2017 um, the court had decided that not much more could be said. So they had held what they called the main meeting of the court. Um, now, the regulator told the court at this meeting that there could be some issues, uh, but they could be dealt with after the government decision. Uh, the court questioned this because this would not be according to the Environmental Act, because both the Nuclear Activities Act and Environmental Act says that the repository has to be shown safe before a government decision. So there was a conflict between the court and the regulator at the, meet, the main meeting of, of, the, of the court. And also, would they have very eminent scientists from, the, from KTH were there, and they strongly questioned in the court, and we had big debates. We had an extra day discussion of copper corrosion in the court. Uh, I have to... But, I mean, um, also, during the court proceedings, there were leaks to the media showing that the regulator had big internal problems in discussions, and um, that uh, one of the, the, the main corrosion expert at the regulator was against saying yes. And also, some scenarios showed that the regulatory limits would be exceeded. So this the material leaked to the to the media, while we had the court, the court meeting was actually going on for uh, for almost. We we had five weeks during a period of two months. We were in different. We were in Oskarshamn and we were in Forsmark also, but mostly we were in Stockholm in this hotel. Uh, and. Um, uh, there, there's a team from, from MKG and the Swedish Society for Nature Conservation. The, the lawyers, the environmental lawyers for the, from the Swedish Society for Nature Conservation, you have Yusia there on the right hand in the middle is Rebecca. Very, very good lawyers, environmental lawyers. And they were very impressive in, when we were in the court. Um, so, um, uh, but this was going on. And here is uh, uh, an article with the leaked documents. And we, of course, then provided briefs to the court, providing all this material, extra material, during the, the, the uh, meeting of the court. Um, it was a very interesting experience. Um, now, the court then went back into its chambers to, to, to look at all the information. And on January 28, 2018, the court made its recommendation to government. And the court recommended that the government would say no to the application, primarily because of the uncertainties regarding the long-term safety due to possible uh, copper canister uh, problems. Now, these issues would have to be resolved, the court said, before the government could take a decision. Uh, on the same date, the regulator also made a recommendation to the government, and they said that it could be yes, because some issues could be dealt with later after the government decision. But also, and this is quite important to understand, the regulator was under the understanding that the repository could be safe, even if the copper canister don't work exactly as postulated because of the other barriers of the clay and the rock. And there is modeling in the safety analysis that shows that if, if the copper canisters don't work, it's not going to be like a, like a big disaster perhaps. But of course, what we think, what, what is important is that the regulatory limits are not exceeded. And if, if the copper doesn't work, 
the regulatory limits will be, will be exceeded and and the regulator should regulator should say no but so but the, the regulator is always talking about how one has to look at the whole system and not only at, the, at for example the copper canister now the court decision took many Swedes by surprise and I would say that we at this time saw it as an important victory both for science and for those who have raised this issue of copper corrosion. Now, what is the problem with copper? <laughs> uh, I'm going to move ahead here with the whole text. Um, basically, the hypothesis is that the water in the repository does not contain any oxygen. I mean, water itself contains oxygen, but the, 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 but the water does not include um, oxygen atoms or oxygen molecules in the water. And this is true because a very fast water, the, the, the bacteria and so on in the repository, they consume the water very fast, uh, the, 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 the oxygen very fast. Because if it was like in the air, I mean, you have buildings also in, in Germany where you have copper roofs and they become, they become green. And of course, copper is, is better than other things to have on roofs, but still copper will only last maybe 100 years, 200 years before you have to, to replace it and there will be holes in the copper. Now, uh, uh, what these researchers at KTH published was that water in itself could attack the copper. And this was understood not to be uh, possible in theory, but in practice, the researchers have said, well, no, well, it looks like water molecules also, which include oxygen also can attack copper. Um, so and this, this, I think there is more and more a shift to understanding that this is actually very correct. And the question is now mostly how fast will this go, this process? Mm -hmm. But the, 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 um, Researchers, they are saying it will take maybe only some hundreds of years before the first canisters break. And then before a thousand years, there will be, there will be radioactivity coming up to the surface. Uh, also at this time, uh, actually in the end of 2017, there were publication of the results of the FebEx experiment. It's a Swiss experiment with copper underneath in, in clay underneath the ground. And you could see clearly that this uh, corrosion had been ongoing. Uh, and it also pitting corrosion means it, it goes down at some areas more than others. You can see mm. this clearly here. And this is like rusting of a car, for example, that that rusting of a car starts at one place and then, then you can actually have a hole in the, in the steel of the car in one place before it actually starts to corrode in other places. And this is very a very bad situation when you have this. And SKB was saying, well, this must be oxygen that has been leaking into the system, which is always their, their explanation. But I think, we, it, I think it's quite clear that this shows the problems. Now, the government then had to do um, a review of the problem. I mean, it had to deal with the copper corrosion issue because the court had said it had to, to to deal with this before it could take a decision. So the company made a submission of a complementary information on copper corrosion in April, 2019. Uh, and we were allowed to comment on this and the, the, the uh, people, the researchers also commented, actually the researchers, all, some of them also made studies for SKB to an, analyze this, this complementary information. And what we can say generally is that there was nothing new here. Nothing new came out here. SKB basically said, well, we don't think the court should be involved with this. And SSM, the regulator, um, it was saying, well, we have to look at the complete, in, the complete uh, system and therefore we don't have to worry about the, the copper problem. So we have a situation where the government uh, uh, had uh, the regulator co convinced that it would be safe and, and, and actually was strengthened in its conviction by this new SKB information. It's pretty crazy. 
Now, we have something else in, in Sweden. We have a scientific advisory board to the government. It's called the Swedish Council for Nuclear Waste. And importantly here, they went out and said there may be problems with the copper and also with the cast iron insert in the copper where, which holds the, the uh, spent fuel, fuel elements in place. Um, and these problems could be so bad that the, the concept does not work. Uh, and we made a strong statement saying that copper should not be used as a canister material. And then all this information then went into the government decision making process. Uh, also, the KTH professor researchers, they persevered in the criticism. And they were then joined by, by this. Uh, the, the, I told you about that one of the SSM corrosion experts, the main one, had been opposed to the, the decision. And he also now joined the KTH um, uh, experts in criticizing the, the, the concept. Now, I'm going to very fast try to move through an unexpected development that came in 2019. Um, because uh, there have been, of course, research in Sweden, especially in an underground hard rock laboratory underneath the Oskarshamn nuclear power plant called the ESPE hard rock laboratory, where they have had copper and clay in repository conditions for a long time. And um, this LOAT project had been ongoing about, since about the year 2000. Uh, it's at 500 meters depth, so it's, 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 it's at repository depth, basically, in granite uh, in this laboratory. And uh, there were seven different packages with copper and clay. It's a very good simulation, actually, of, of real repository conditions. And three one-year packages were taken out early, but in 2006, one five-year package was taken up. And this was during, you know, just after SKB, uh, MKG had been created. I started to work for MKG. I came from the university uh, and then I've, I've done research in, in, in different issues regarding nuclear waste before at the university. Um, uh, but we also at this time were very interested in these results. And it was very, very unclear the results. They did not want to show the results properly. But we could understand that there was an unexpected amount of copper corrosion that had occurred already after five years. And we had then for long demanded that the next package be retrieved and analyzed. And this is how it looks like. Um, okay, you are in a tunnel 500 meters, 400 meters underground, and there is a hole in the ground. It's not as big as a complete a can, a copper canister. Uh, it's actually the copper tube. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then there is clay around it. And, the, and the, the, the main interest of this experiment is to, to, to look how clay swells and protects the canister as water enters this system. But they have also got copper coupons. And of course, the, the whole copper, um, central copper part here is also copper. So, so, so there's a lot of copper available to study. Um, so here you have uh, how it looks like. Uh, with the experiment, they, you know, they, they measure a lot of, of sensors and so on here also. Uh, but this is also, this when they have taken up the, the coupons is taken up here, and you can actually see that coupon is quite, is, is quite uh, uh, badly corroded. Uh, and also the central rod here is, is uh, uh, taken up, and this is, this is part of the central rod. Um, now, what happened was that in the autumn of 2019, SKB secretly, they did not tell anybody about this, they, they retrieved two now 20-year-old packages. And this was disclosed by SKB, likely as a mistake, at a meeting that was organized by the regulator in October 2019. Actually, I, I asked SKB the question, when is the next loot package to be retrieved? And they say, well, we already done it. And, and everybody was surprised by this. And we worked very hard to get SKB to, to disclose all relevant to copper corrosion results because they said, well, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to wait with the results until after the government has given us a permit <laughs> to start with. And then we also wanted SSM, the regulator, to check the results. And this, this has happened. 
uh, SKB published corrosion results in 2020, and SSM has carried out a quality assurance project with the support of, of, a, comp of a UK consultancy company called Galson Sciences. Now, um, so um, we also then told the government that it should wait for these results because if they were, if the corrosion was as bad as in the Fabric experiment, then something is wrong with the copper canister as a canister material. And what happened was that when we saw the publication results, SKB did not do it scientifically. And I will explain this. Um, basically, you have the report here. It's on, anybody can, can get the report. Um, and there are nice pictures of, of copper corrosion. This is, this is the bottom plate here at the bottom. And, and uh, here uh, is an image of the copper, of the pitting corrosion at this part of the, of, the, of the tube. Now, the problem is here that the tube is heated on the bottom half. This part here, the red thing is the heating of the tube. So it's much warmer down in this area and SKB refused to publish detailed corrosion results of the most corroded areas down here. They also refused to, to produce corrosion results of this part, which was not against the clay, but against SAM down here, which was also very relevant to understand corrosion. So what can we say? We said to SSM, what, how can you allow this? And SSM said, well, we don't think copper corrosion is a problem. So we think this is okay. And it's really frustrating to work in a system where the regulator uh, is not doing its work properly. So, and we, we, we basically are of understanding that if SKB had published results of the copper corrosion, it would, it would show the same problem as the FEBEX experiment. And the cop, it will be clear that copper would not work as a canister material. But in March, 2020, SSM uh, made a statement and they accepted reporting without any analysis of its own. And we were very concerned that we had this situation of the capture of the, of the regulator at this time, because this was really not, not what we were expecting from the regulator. And of course the government was in a difficult situation now because the regulator's voice is very important. I mean, the, the government is supposed to rely on the regulator for its advice uh, on, on these issues. Um, but also the Swedish Council for Nuclear Waste at this time was very concerned about how the regulator was acting. So now we are in 20, we have been in, in, in uh, um, uh, 2020, uh, things continued to develop, there were discussions going on, but in 2021, something happened. Um, first of all, discussion about nuclear power and nuclear waste management became politicized uh, because by now the, 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 the industry was, was uh, quite anxious to have the decision by the government. It had been already been two years before the application had been handed in. And they asked the industry, basically, I think, asked the, the right wing politicians to start to, to pressure the government to take a decision. Uh, also at this time, I think many of the, of the right-wing parties realized that they could use nuclear power as a climate, uh, a climate change policy uh, because they didn't have very good climate change policy, but to say we can have nuclear power became something that they focused on in a very populist way. Um, now, since 2018, the government had been a coalition between the Social Democrats and the Green Party. Um, it was a minority coalition, but the Green Minister of Environment uh, was very reluctant to approve any repository. Uh, now, during the spring and summer, as I was saying, the the the, the Pressure on the government increased from the from the from the from the parliament and from the um, industry. Uh, now, one one thing that is important here is that we talked about club, this intermediate storage facility, about with the water basins and so on. Now, the capacity for for club uh, was 
oh, is only allowed to 8,000 tons at, at this time. And part of the application, which was handed in separately in 2015, was that club should be increased to 11,000 tons. It doesn't mean to build a new facility. It just means that they, it's one compact that they spend fuel. Now, the industry claimed that club was to be full by 2023, and therefore the, the whole nuclear power industry would be stopped and so on. And so therefore, the, the government needed to take a decision on the whole application, including the spent fuel repository. Now, the government didn't do this. Instead, in August, they separated the club issue from the repository with a special decision. Mm -hmm. So now at this time, the court is dealing with the, with the, the question of how to expand um, the permit for, for club. And it's actually moving quite fast along. The only problem is this discussion between the, the, reg the regulator and, and, the, and the industry, and SKB about the cooling system. Uh, but it, that's just a small detail. I think that the, the, the club issue, the license will probably come within a year or so. Uh, so that, that, that issue was taken off the table. But, uh, actually not the but, but also, uh, the copper corrosion discussion had become more intense in the autumn. Um, the KTH researchers came up with new results showing that there was a problem. Everybody was discussing whether you know the loot experiment and how could it how how could the SSM do this with the loot experiment? Um, uh, so there were there were discussions uh, on regarding issues also during the autumn of 2021. We're we talking about last autumn. This was going on last autumn. Um, and we told the government that if they actually pressured the industry to do a proper analysis of the copper corrosion in the loot experiment to examine those issues, those hottest, hottest areas, it would could provide useful information. They could even do a, a, a few other experiments uh, to test whether how, how fast the oxygen had been consumed in the, in the experiment, because SKB was claiming that everything was done was due to that oxygen had been trapped in the system which is what, which is pretty crazy um, so we are in a situation where both skb and ssm are convinced there are no copper problems that can be important enough for long term safety and they're also saying well all the other barriers are there so everything will be safe um, the swedish council for nuclear waste however it actually stated that more research had to be done. Uh, they said it could be done after a government decision, but I think the government understood that if there was need for more research, then they could not say yes, because that they would not have enough information. Um, but the council also wanted the government to give it a, only a construction license. Uh, so there will be another special license for operational, uh, but that, that's such a construction would be a new a legal construction. It would it would not be according to the environmental code. So, some some many things had to be changed for that. Uh, at this time, also, actually since twenty nineteen, the, the government also had a decision on its table to expand the, the repository at Forsmark, the one the one the SFR for short lived waste. This was also on the government's table. So we had been in parallel working with this other repository. Uh, and then things really happened. Uh, in November, December, there was political turmoil in the budget process. It's complicated, but it meant that the Green Party left government. Now, this meant that a new Social Democrat Ministry of Environment came in, and she promised uh, the decision on the expansion of SFR was to be taken already before Christmas. And she promised a repository decision on January 27. She didn't say whether they're going to say yes or no, but she said there will be a decision on, in, in, on January 27. Mm -hmm. And of course, what happened was that the Social Democrat government wanted a repository. Um, they are not very pro-nuclear, they're actually you know, very mixed on nuclear and, and they have been 
very much pro-renewables and as they still are, but they didn't want to have this question of the repository uh, as we are approaching the elections in, in, in September, I think. Um, but this decision relied almost exclusively on the statement from SSM. So the regulators, what they were saying became very important. What the court had said in 2018 was ignored basically, I would say. Um, and, but at least, of course, the industry was very happy about this situation. Now, this decision can be appealed to the highest administrative court, which is a constitutional court, but only for judicial review. And there is an ongoing process within MKG and with the Swedish Society for Nature Conservation Lawyers to prepare such an appeal. Um, and it has to be submitted by, by uh, April 27th within three months. Uh, I can not say very much more about that, but the, 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 there are a lot of, of interesting judicial issues here. <laughs> uh, whether we can, what happens if we can, if one can win such an appeal, the decision will go back to the government again. So the government will have it back on the table again. So that the, this court cannot say, no, we can say, well, no, the government didn't do its job properly, or it can say, yes, the government did its job properly. And if it does say yes, then the whole system, the application goes back to the environmental court. Uh, the, same, the same judge at the court that said no previously, he will have to take this decision back and there will be decisions and there will, it will take several years because you can appeal different decisions within the court system here. So um, possible a construction start in five years, operation in 15 years. This is where we are, we are standing at, at this time. And I don't know, the copper corrosion issue, I think it will not go away. Uh, despite the position of SSM. And, and the, the government actually said very clearly that more research has to be done, it has to be continued and so on. But of course, as long as the position of SSM is that it doesn't really matter if the copper, copper canister works or not, that's crudely stated, but it, it, this, is the, what, this is the kind of, of, of understanding that we have that they are not very interested in, in these issues. But we also see actually that SSM is now doing more research on copper corrosion. We will see what happens here. Now, on the Swedish website, um, there is actually an English part there. And uh, there you can find more information about this in English. Uh, and uh, we don't update it as often as we update the Swedish part. But of course, Google Translate should also allow you to, to do a lot of understanding of, this, of the Swedish site. Uh, so, that is what I would like to say.